You never really quit karate. It's something you do for the rest of your life. How's it going, everybody? It's episode 68 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sensei Rocky DeRico. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but here on Martial Arts Radio, I'm your host. Whistlekick, as many of you know, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners, and thank those of you tuning in again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. One of our most popular items is our sweatpants, and those of you out there that have a pair know why. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Just like with our last couple of episodes, this one features a quiz. So after you've listened, head on over to the website, go to the show notes, take the quiz, and see how you stack up to others on the leaderboard. We're starting to see some of you take those quizzes, which is great. Don't be afraid to give us some feedback. We're still figuring those out. Today we're joined by Sensei Rocky DeRico, an excellent martial artist and accomplished competitor. Sensei DeRico, like all of our guests, loves the martial arts. Unlike a lot of our guests, though, he's made competition a core part of his training and career. We spent some time talking about that, but also his traditional roots, how he got started, and a whole lot more. So let's hear what he has to say. Sensei DeRico, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, it's, the, the pleasure is all mine. This is going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to hearing your answers to all these questions and getting to know you a little bit better, and I'm sure the listeners are too. You, you've, you've got a name that goes back a little ways, and, and I'm sure you're I'm not the only person who recognizes your name, especially those of us up here in the Northeast. But before we get too deep into some of these things that you're known for, why don't we go back? How did you get started in the martial arts and why? I was always fascinated by martial arts in the 1960s. I used to see bits and pieces of martial arts on TV shows, The Wild Wild West and a few other shows. So I was fascinated. But since there were very few martial arts schools, I never really had the opportunity to train. Then in 1972, a friend of mine was training at a school in Waltham, Massachusetts. His name, by the way, is Steve McGowan. Steve was showing me some techniques that he had learned while training at that particular school called United Studios of Self-Defense. And that got me really interested. And a few months later, I joined the school. Great. So tell us a little bit about that, that early time, you know, um, so you're, you're seeing martial arts on television and maybe in some movies and what was it that drew you to it? Well, I think it's because it was always considered mystical that someone could throw a punch or a kick and drop a big opponent down. And me not being a very big person myself felt drawn to that concept of being able to defeat a larger opponent. So those TV shows uh, often would have one person that perhaps was the star defeat either a bigger opponent or perhaps multiple opponents. And I found that very interesting. And so with your, your early start in the martial arts, did you, did you find that mystical piece or... Yes. Was reality okay? Yes, uh, I did. Uh, I found that if you train and you learn the techniques properly, the techniques are effective, and therefore you do possess that ability. It's all in a matter of training and being patient and learning the technique properly and keep training until you perfect it. So... Here you are, you're training in, in Massachusetts, I think you said Waltham, and you know, you're you're getting going. How give us a rough idea. How how old were you? Were you a teenager, child, adult? Well, I had just turned twenty. It was nineteen seventy two. I joined the school in 
late in the year, and I enjoyed it immediately. I remember walking up the very first day up the set of stairs because the school was on the second floor, and here I was with each step that I took thinking, okay, my initiation is going to be that they're going to beat me up to see if I'm really serious about training, but actually it was not that way at all. They were friendly, and I had a great time in my first class. And you were hooked? Yes, I was hooked. And you never stopped? And I never stopped. I think that's that's pretty similar to most of the guests that we've had. For whatever reason, you know, everybody comes to it for a slightly different reason, but very rarely do they fade away. They just keep going. And I think that's one of the beauties of martial arts is that you can just you can keep going as as you age, as as your body changes. There's a, always a different way to approach the martial arts. But let's move on. Let's start talking about some stories here as our listeners know we're all about the stories. I'm, I'm a fan of a good story, of course, and I'm sure you've got a ton of them. But why don't you start? Why don't you tell us your best martial arts story? Well, as far as my best martial arts story, I probably would have to say my best martial art highlight. I have many, but I would say representing the United States in Italy in 1995, where we did 10 shows in 10 days in 10 different cities. And the reason why is, first of all, representing the United States was such an honor, but also I was born in Italy and I lived there until I was six years old. I never got to see the country, and this was a perfect opportunity for me to go back to my country where I was born and actually get to see the cities and many of the famous landmarks and so forth. So I found that to be perhaps the highlight of my martial arts career. That sounds like a pretty incredible trip. So when you say representing, now this was, these were demonstrations rather than competitions? Yes, there was a promoter in Italy that had a special show he would do every year called Pasqua del Budo. And basically what that means is martial art Easter. And he would invite someone to represent various countries from around the world. And I was chosen in that particular year, 1995. Wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. So obviously you weren't the only one over there. Any other names we might know? Any any of your, your compatriots that we may recognize? Well, uh, Carmichael Simon was another American. He was also on Team Paul Mitchell. And also my teacher happened to be chosen that year to demonstrate his self-defense techniques. My teacher being Grandmaster Nick Serio. There's a couple of names that people might recognize. Great. So was that at all an, an emotional trip for you? I mean, I could imagine that. Absolutely. That, that might get, okay. Absolutely. It was emotional because even though I am proud to be an American citizen and I consider myself an American, I still have a connection to Italy, obviously. I haven't been born there and still have relatives there. So for me to go back and see for myself what the country is like and uh, eat the food and meet the people. It, it was very emotional. Yeah, sounds like a great trip. Wonderful. And it, and of course, I, I've talked to a lot of people that have done international travel with respect to martial arts and, you know, the martial arts community that we have, you, you know, whether it's it's in your, your city or, or your state, your region, you know, it transcends, and I'm guessing that you experienced that too, that maybe there were, I don't, I don't know if there were people from other countries outside of Italy involved in this too, but I'm going to guess you found um, quite a few new friends very quickly. I did, as a matter of fact. I made friends from France, Australia, Germany, and many other places. And just for the record, in reference to this uh, Pasqua del Budo, I 
was uh, paid to do this. They paid me a fee plus all my expenses, including food, hotel, travel, you name it. And when my students would ask me how much they paid me, I told them it was one million lire, <laughs> which is true. And that equates to about $1,500. Right. A million of something sounds like a lot until you consider the exchange rate for sure. Yes. So let's go back. Let's let's go back to, you know, time when you're 19 and something happens in your life and you don't end up going to that martial arts school that day. And for whatever reason, you never step foot in a martial arts school. Take a moment. Imagine what your life would look like. And then tell us about it. Very good question. If I had never trained in martial arts, I probably would have become a history teacher, which I'm sure I would have done a good job. But most importantly, almost certainly, I probably would have ne never met my future wife, who I met in 1975 when she joined my school in Arlington, Massachusetts. So that would have changed everything. Yeah. My wife trained for five years, earned her black belt, and she's still training to this day. We got married in 1978 and was still married 38 years later. She's not only my wife, but she's also my best friend. Her name is Wendy. Well, that that's a pretty big piece of your life. And of course, a, a lot of the people listening have likely, if not met their spouse through the martial arts, have trained or, or, or something. At, martial arts, of course, tends to be a family affair. I don't have to tell you that, but I'm sure everybody else out there listening knows that. So I think we can all say it's a great thing that you started training. And I'm sure Wendy would say the same thing. Hopefully she would say the same thing, right? Well, yes, uh, but she often jokes and she says she married the teacher so she wouldn't have to pay for lessons. <laughs> I know a few other people who have done that too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so let's bring it back. We can come back into real reality now. And, and you did get to start training at 20 and, and you have every everything that you've learned and as you look back now, I'd like you to imagine, not imagine, I'd like you to remember a difficult time, a challenging time, whether that was a day or a month or, or, or some part of your life, and tell us how your martial arts training or experience helped you overcome it. Well, I can't specifically think of one difficult time. I think most of us have many difficult times in our lives. And for me personally, I think my martial arts training helped me through many of those difficult times. Can you tell us a little more? What, when you, how about this? I'll, I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit. So let's say in your day-to-day -day life, you bump up against something, be it a, a, a difficult person uh, outside the dojo, of course. Um, you know, just something that seems a little overwhelming. How do you approach that? How do you gather yourself and move through? Okay. Um, well, I can say this. I've never really had to use my martial arts training, physical training, except for one time when I had a drunk person grab me around the neck and I used one kick and it was over. But on several occasions, when there were people that wanted to try to fight me uh, to prove that they were right, I would just get in the stance and give a loud key eye. So I consider those few times that I was approached where somebody thought they were going to be able to defeat me a difficult time because you have to do the right thing at the right time. And I felt I reacted in all of those situations correctly. 
including a time when I was in Boston, the beautiful day um, on Harrison Avenue in Boston, and a homeless person, I was trying to help. I asked him if there was anything I could do to help him. And all of a sudden, he reached in his, into his pocket and pulled out a knife and said he was going to cut me up. And I just backed off a little bit, watched him. He didn't do much after that. And I walked away, and I felt I did the right thing. People asked me why I didn't kick him or punch him. But I never really felt threatened. So, I, again, I felt that even though that was potentially a difficult time for me, I did the right thing, and martial arts helped me through it. I'm reminded of one of the quotes from Karate Kid. Maybe I don't think it's the first one, but maybe I'm jumbling them. When Mr. Miyagi says, best not fight, but if fight, win. Mm. I like that. That one's always stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times I think as martial artists, the outside world looks at us and thinks that what we're training for almost exclusively is to win a fight when I would argue that most of our training is to not even have the fight. Yes. I don't know if you'd agree. I totally agree. You, oh, good. Good. We're on the same page. That makes this go better. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Professor Sirio, who, of course, is, is a, a legendary figure in the Kempo world. But other than him, other than the people that you've had as your formal instructors – if you had to name someone as the most influential in your martial arts career, who would it be? Well, there have been several, but if I had to pick one, I would have to say the coach of Team Paul Mitchell, Grandmaster Don Rodriguez. He asked me to be on the team in 1990, and I said to him, well, I have to think about it. So I thought about it for about two seconds, and I said yes. And then <laughs> I have been always happy to be on the team and have Coach Rodriguez as a person that's always inspired me to do better. And uh, a lot of my success in competition, I would say, is a direct result of him believing in me and pushing me and supporting me. Now, something that we haven't really talked about much on this show is that level of competition where people are organized into teams and, and have coaches. And of course we've had other members of, of team Paul Mitchell on here. We, we've had Christine Bannon Rodriguez on here. We've had, Freddie LePan on here, you know, people that, of course, you know both of them quite well. Yes. But if someone was out there right now and they're listening and they, they wanted to coach martial artists at that high competitive level, what would you say makes Grandmaster Rodriguez a great coach for you? Well, I see how he coaches various competitors and he really knows how to motivate them. He knows how to say the right thing at the right time. He probably would have been a successful coach in any sport because of his dedication. He believes in, in himself. He's just a very motivating person. So for me personally, it was the perfect person to have motivate me. He would be at the ring where you're competing, calling your name and cheering you on. So I think it's just the overall attitude that he has where he believes in his team, he cheers his team, he gives valuable advice to the team, so, therefore, I think anybody on the team is going to benefit from having Don Rodriguez as their coach. What were practices like with him? Well, we didn't have a lot of practices. 
because we would all come from all over the United States. Uh, so we didn't really get a chance to have too many. Uh, he would always expect the best from us. He would expect our best performance every time, no matter what, whether you didn't feel well or maybe had a slight injury. And um, he demanded the best, and uh, we, he probably got the best. Great. Yeah, he's he's someone that um, is on our short list to have on the show. So if if you're listening now, Mr. Rodriguez, I want to talk to you. <laughs> so competition, of course, competition is something that I would say is core to your ties in the martial arts. Would you agree with that? It's pretty fundamental for who you are. Yes. I went to my first tournament in 1973. I had a lot of fun and I was hooked. I really enjoyed tournaments. What is it about tournaments that you enjoy? The competition and the camaraderie. I have made so many friends through competition, people from all over the world and so many from different states in the United States. And so many of them are such good friends that if I'm ever in a particular part of the country, I know that they would invite me to their home, to their dojo. And that's such a good feeling to know that you have so many friends in so many places. Yeah, it's like having a whole other martial arts family. Well put. I, I agree with that. Some people that, that listen to the show know a little bit about my past. And I don't talk about this very often, but I used to compete as a, as a teenager and you know had that big, broad competition family. And then when Whistle Kick started, one of the ways that we market, we attend martial arts events. So there was a nearly 20-year gap in there but it was like I never left. All these people are still my friends. They're still doing the same thing. Well, not the same things. You know, some of them that were competing are now coaching. But that family is still there. And you know, that's one of the things I love about martial arts, whether it's the arts itself or the people. It's always there for you. And I think that's pretty fantastic. It is. I, I have to agree with you, Jeremy. When you make friends in the martial arts, they're basically friends for life. Sometimes even even the ones that maybe, I don't want to say you don't want, but <laughs> some are better friends than others. And sometimes what's interesting take that, the good with the bad. <laughs> yes. What I, interesting, I found that some of the people that competed against me and wanted to beat me, became my best friends. And I have no doubt that once any of you stepped into that ring, that friendship was had the pause button on it because it's a lot more fun to compete against your friends and to push your friends and to best your friends. Absolutely. One thing I always have prided myself in doing, and that's always congratulating all those that competed against me for their effort. Now, I was very fortunate enough to win. I don't know exactly, you know, what the percentage is, but I know it's over 90% uh, of my competitions. But I made it a point to always congratulate anyone that competed against me. Yeah, stepping into the competition ring is, is intimidating doesn't matter how good you are. Absolutely. And even though I was the number one seed for so many years and was expected to win uh, my weapons forms and my, cop, and my weapons and cop divisions, I always felt like I had to prove myself because I didn't want to be in a position where I didn't have my best performance and someone would say, I can't believe that guy is rated number one. Look at him. He doesn't look that good. So I always push myself as well as having Coach Rodriguez push me. Sometimes there can be more pressure being the one with the expectations than being the underdog. Yes, 
And I always competed against great competitors. I always competed against people like Terry Kramer, you know, just to name one, but I competed against yeah. uh, Jim Smith, who's now rated as one of the top senior competitors. And there were many others. Sensei Brian Ritchie, I actually competed against my own teacher for a short period of time, uh, which was a little bit challenging because I felt like maybe I shouldn't be in the ring with him because he was my teacher. But I do recall one time we were both in the grand championship and I bowed out to him out of respect. And what was, what was his reaction to that? Well, he was honored. And then there was another tournament where he had to leave early and we would have again clashed in the grand championship. So he allowed me to go and I was able to secure that grand championship. You mentioned Jim Smith. Uh, loyal listeners will know that we've had him on the show. And anyone that is friends with him now knows that not only is he still competing and still competing at a high level, but he's probably the most prolific competitor that I'm aware of, usually competing twice in a weekend. And if you're out there listening, uh, Hanshi Smith, it's probably on the way to another competition right now. <laughs> yes, the last I heard, he was in Puerto Rico representing the United States. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the last that I heard from him too. So, um, and from my man. understanding, he also won first place in Kata and weapons. I didn't have a chance to see that, but I have no doubt I've seen him compete. He is quite the competitor. Yes. I would say, uh, over the last couple of years, he was my toughest competitor. I was very fortunate to be successful against him, but he did beat me in Kata in Washington, D.C. in 2015. So you're still competing as well? Well, I came back from a little break of not competing when Kevin Thompson, my teammate, was struck with ALS, and I felt compelled to compete and uh, dedicate my competitions to him. And I competed uh, 2013, 14, and 15. Now this year, 2016, I'm taking the year off. Okay. So will we see you competing next year then? Is that is that the plan? Eh, probably. Uh, although I might do a couple of tournaments late in the year. There's a couple of tournaments I really like. One is Lee Ireland tournament in New York. And then a friend of mine has a tournament in Philadelphia and in December, Hugo Armando, and I'll probably go to his tournament. I've always had fun. He is a great promoter. He really takes uh, good care of the competitors. It's a very uh, good tournament if you're a competitor because there's a lot of uh, effort made into making the competitor feel welcome. Great. Sure. So, you know, I can imagine some of the listeners out there now saying, well, he started competing in 73 and, and he's still competing. I mean, that's, that's quite a lot of years of competition. You've competed at a high level. You've been successful. Now, clearly you enjoy it, but what is it that keeps you going in competition? Is there, is there something left that you're looking to accomplish? No, I feel like I've already accomplished everything I wanted to in competition. Uh, but I really enjoy the camaraderie. I enjoy the actual physical techniques when I'm performing on the floor. And I feel that in order for me to compete at a high level, I have to train diligently so that I can compete effectively. So that motivates me to keep training hard and not get lazy, which helps me become a better teacher in my dojo. as some that we've had on the show recently have said, leading by example, leading from the front to demonstrate, you know, you can still walk the walk even after you've done it a bunch of times. Absolutely. I think also I like to represent competitors that are a little bit older and I'd like to get them to think that they can do it too, that 
age doesn't have to be a challenge to train in martial arts or even to compete in martial arts. I have a student that started training when he was 70 and now is 75 and he's still training and um, he really loves it. That's great. Now, one of the things, and, and clearly you're not doing this, uh, one of the things that I've always been uh, a little, very gently critical of is when martial artists reach a point of stature, when they, they achieve a high rank, and not only do they not compete, but they they don't tend to demonstrate their skill at their top level to their students and to others. and. I think it's great that you and, and others like Hanshi Smith are out there competing because it shows those of us that are younger, that are less skilled, what we can aspire to. It's very motivating. So just personally, I want to thank you for continuing to do that and for any of the others out there that are doing that. And for those of you that maybe have a school that um, take a little bit more of an armchair approach at times. I'd like to encourage you to consider what it's like from your student's perspective to see what you're capable of. There is nothing more motivating. Great point, Jeremy. So we've talked about a few names, people that you've had the chance to compete with, to train under. But if you could go back, or, or even now, let's say, if you could train someone that you hadn't had the opportunity to, be they alive or dead, who would that be and why? Well, that question is a tough one to answer because I think way back and wonder what it would have been like to train with Funakoshi, who started Shotokan, uh, Yamaguchi, who I believe started Goju. And I think any of those early pioneers in martial arts would have been great. Uh, I believe Bill Wallace is a great martial artist. Uh, he has come to my school and demonstrated seminars several times now. And I consider him to be one of the best because he's so good at what he does. He works with someone as young as three as effectively as he can work with somebody 73. And he's got the humor, and he's just got a great attitude. So it's really hard to pinpoint one person. But I would put Bill Wallace at the top of the list simply because I got to know him really well. I have a lot of respect for him. He is a, a great guy, a great martial artist. Um, listeners know we've had him on the show. Uh, this is fun. You're dropping these names, and I get to say, well, we've had them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's he's a fantastic man, and, and you're right. His sense of humor is probably unparalleled for at least any martial artist I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And so just to, to put it out there, anybody that has a chance to train with him, if he's doing a seminar anywhere within driving distance of you, please go. You will not regret it. Yes. Are you at all a movie guy? You like martial arts movies? Absolutely. I have my favorites. Uh, some of them may surprise some people, but nonetheless, they're my personal favorites, if you'd like to know. I would love to know. Well, not necessarily in this order, but the movie Sidekick with Chuck Norris, I thought was very well done. Um, that's one of my very favorites, as is yeah. Billy Jack. Mm. And maybe the all-time martial arts movie favorite for most martial artists, Enter the Dragon. Yeah. So those are my top three, but there are many. I mean, I like martial arts movies as a rule, whether it be Jackie Chan or whoever, Cynthia Rothrock, whoever. But those are my top three. Those are great choices, and you are the first person, I believe, to mention Sidekick. We've had other Chuck Norris movies mentioned, but uh, I think it's great that you're mentioning that one. It's one that I think a lot of people often forget. And then Billy Jack, I think, is probably, for its time, 
the most underrated martial arts film. That's a great point. I have to agree with you on that. If anybody out there, if you don't know the history of that movie, the go look it up. It's uh, we'll put some stuff in the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, dot com. Not just a, a link to the movie, but maybe a link to some of the the history on it and how it got going. Uh, because the gentleman who starred in it, and I'm losing his name, Tom Laughlin. Right. Thank you. Was not a martial artist when it started. He saw what was coming, but instead of just kind of faking it or hiring stunt doubles, he went into, I think it was six months of intensive, like eight hour a day training. So he could represent the martial arts well on film. And I think that there's a vibe captured in that film that I've never seen in any other movie. Yes. It was, it, I really liked the story good guy versus bad guy sort of thing. And he tried to write a lot of wrongs that were going on. And it's just really a good movie. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I have watched it on several occasions. And sometimes I go on YouTube and I watch some of the highlights of the movie, which anybody can do, which I think is, is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I don't know if you know the the fictional character Master Ken. If you've had a chance to see any of the Enter the Dojo humorous films on YouTube, but we had him on on the show in, in his real life car- uh, persona, Matt Page, and he was talking about as a kid having his VHS tapes of martial arts films queued up to the fight scenes that he liked. <laughs> so he would just watch the fight scene and then rewind it. So if he had five minutes before school, he could watch the fight scene. But now we get YouTube. That's that's so funny because I can see a lot of people doing that. I know for a fact, I mean, going way, way back before we even had a VCR, the local convenience store would rent VCRs and they would rent movies. I mean, they had like, you know, a hundred movies, if, if that. And, you know, I would end up with, with something and watch it, you know, 20 times all weekend. And then once I knew where, where the good fight scenes were, I was doing the exact same thing, rewinding and just playing that five minutes over and over. And I feel bad. I apologize to the people who own that store. I probably wore out some of your tapes. So we don't have any common actors among those movies. Do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Again, that's a real tough one. Um, I think there are, there have been so many good ones. Uh, obviously, Tom Laughlin in the Billy Jack movies. Uh, Bruce Lee, I thought, acted extremely well. Uh, Chuck Norris obviously has. Cynthia Rothrock. I mean, there's just, just so many. It's not easy for me to pick one. If I had to pick one, I'd probably say Chuck Norris. Sure. Now, Cynthia Rothrock is a name that doesn't come up on the show as often, maybe because she's not quite as active as she once was. I mean, if you go to any uh, martial arts hall of fames or things like that, she is involved. She's got some business ventures and she's certainly both an accomplished actress and martial artist. But maybe for the people out there that don't know who she is, is there a uh, movie of hers that you'd recommend that they could start with? Well, Off the top of my head, um, I can't think of the name of one of her movies, but I know that she's been in many. A lot of the movies that she filmed were actually done in Asia. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she's been in maybe 40 or 50 movies. So It's quite a list. And so what we'll do, um, I'll find a couple off air and then run them by you and see if you have a pick out of there. the most recent thing that she was in was the martial arts kid kind of the oh, and I, sort of and modern I, remake. It's funny. I couldn't even think of that. And I just saw that movie, the martial art kid. What did you think? I thought she, she did a great job and I thought it was a great movie. Obviously the martial art kid is sort of like on the same storyline as the original karate kid movie. But nonetheless, I really liked it for the simple reason that there were real martial artists in the movie had a good storyline and I also like Don the Dragon Wilson in that movie. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a fantastic martial artist and, and a great guy. And anybody that doesn't know him, go do your homework. You'll, you'll be glad that you did. So how about books? Are you a reader at all? Uh, I am a reader and I have read many and rather than giving you a list, I'm going to just give you the one I recommend to all my students that are perhaps 10 years old and older to read. And that's called Zen and the Martial Arts by Joe Hines. Yeah. It's good reading. It's simple reading, has very good stories. I think it helps a lot of beginners understand the martial arts perhaps a little bit better. So that's the one I recommend. It's a classic, and it's the first martial arts book I read. And it's been coming up a lot on the show. So let's, listeners, take that as a sign. If you have not read that book, it is time. I mean, we've had, um, I think, three of the last four interviews that you'll have heard recommended that book. So time to go add that to your reading list. So obviously, you've you've done a lot. You've accomplished a lot of things and. You know, we, we talked about it with respect to competition, that there really aren't goals, per se, that are driving you, but rather other things to motivate you. But do you have any martial arts-related goals? Well, since I've reached or exceeded all my martial arts goals, I would say that any future goal would be in reference to to continue to inspire others whether it's through competition, through my teaching, to inspire others. Because I have, I've had this belief for many, many years that if everybody, I mean literally everybody, if everybody over the age of five, all over the world, practiced martial arts, and they lived by the martial arts code, that the world would be a much better place for everybody. Now, that's wishful thinking, but I think that that speaks volumes about the effect that martial arts training can have on the individual. I believe that any person that trains in martial arts will do everything better than without martial arts. Now, people that have listened to this show for a while may think that I set you up on that question because you answered what you just said there is not quite word for word, but 100% the sentiment of something I've shared on the show many times. And no, I did not do that. And I, and I would love for you to back me up on that. Uh, I've got a smile no, on my face here. No, I, I, I say this to my classes. Um, I remind my classes of the very thing I just said, maybe once a month. And uh, I have most of my class, I have parents sitting and watching. And I consider that very powerful because when I mention something to my, let's say, my children's class, and the parents are listening. Now they can go home and reinforce a lot of the things I've said, and I think it makes uh, it makes for a better student when the parents can say, "Don't forget what Sensei said." And at the same time, what's interesting is the parents will kind of use me as the bad guy and say, "Now look, Sensei says you should have this attitude at home. You're supposed to listen." So it works. Uh, very well um, when I get those messages across to my classes. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a powerful concept, the idea that that martial arts can have such influence. And, you know, one of the pieces that I often tack on, and I'm curious your feelings on this, I don't believe there's anything else that someone can do for as short of a time – let's say six months, that will carry with them for the rest of their life. I like that. I, I like that very much. I'm going to start using that today. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, please take it, run with it. Let's, let's get more people training and, and uh, see if we can affect the world. And that leads me to a very quick story I want to mention. A good friend of mine please. Uh, who has a school in Connecticut Kevin Sullivan, he's also a grandmaster, and his specialty is pressure points. But he mentioned a story at my school 
about a month ago when he was teaching a seminar. Very powerful story. He has two daughters that trained when they were kids with him. At 19, uh, one of his daughters and he had a falling out. I don't know what it was about, and it's not really important. They didn't talk for a year. Out of the blue, a year later, the daughter calls the father and says, Dad, thank you for teaching me karate. And he asks, why are you now talking to me and why are you telling me the story? She said, Dad, I'm the only one at college out of my six girlfriends that hasn't been raped. Her karate saved her from being raped where her friends were all raped in various situations, whether they were parties that they went to or whatever. I just felt that that was a really powerful story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is a little bit of, of preaching to the choir here because the majority of the people that we have listening are martial artists. We do have some that aren't, you know, we get feedback from them as well, which is great. But yeah, I mean, that really lines up pretty well. And, you know, whether that, whether it was the, the self-defense aspects of the martial arts that helped her avoid that horrible situation, or if it was the confidence or the ability to avoid a difficult situation, you know, whatever it was. Exactly. Good point, because you know, it's not just the self-defense. It's people can can really feel the confidence, or maybe the person doesn't put themselves in situations where they become vulnerable. Whatever it is, I, I totally agree. The, the, the training is what uh, makes all the difference. So here's your chance to, you know, kind of have a commercial, toot your own horn, whatever it is. Uh, what, what do you have going on now? If people want to get a hold of you, if people want to come train with you, you know, do you offer seminars? Tell us what's going on. Yes, uh, I do offer seminars. I teach at my two schools, one in Natick, Massachusetts, one in Arlington, Massachusetts. I also happen to teach in three after-school programs where I go right to the school and teach uh, kids in their own school. I, I do demos. I'm doing a demonstration with the Shaolin monks at Harvard University on March 25th, which happens to be a Friday. And I can be reached via my cell phone or my email. My Do I need to give my cell phone or my email? That's a, I'm asking you the question, Jeremy. I'm sorry. Should I? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I had I had the microphone muted for a moment. Um, nope. No. Why don't you go ahead and share those? Because we will put them over on the show notes, but not everyone heads over to that. So if you just give it out yeah. now, if you're willing I, to. I give all my friends and all the families I teach my personal email and my cell phone number because I want to be reachable. I don't want them to call just my office and only be available only a portion of the day. So in any event, my cell phone number is 508-662-4962. I'll repeat that, 508-662-4962. And my email is my name, RockyDurico at gmail.com. Durico spelled D-I-R-I-C-O. So if anyone wants to get a hold of you, yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. Do you have any parting words of wisdom for those that may be listening? Well, I think I've already mentioned a few things, uh, words of wisdom, if you will. Uh, but I want to mention that even though most people know me as a teacher of the martial arts and a competitor and having success in both of those areas, I also was a promoter in the early 80s through the 90s, and I promoted three national tournaments with NASCA, 1986, 87, and 88, and it was called the Boston Nationals. And this is a footnote that maybe very few people know, but I sold my Boston Nationals after 1988 to a person that maybe some of you have heard of out there. Uh, because he's now the head of NBL, Boyce Lydell. I sold him my tournament for $1,000, and 
and Boyce Lydell started the NBL, the National Black Belt League, and now has his own organization. I enjoyed being a promoter. I felt like I was a good promoter, but I felt overwhelmed at times and decided to stop promoting big tournaments and started to compete again more readily after 1988. And also, I'm proud to be in 10 different halls of fame. Uh, this is not to brag, but just to let people know that I've been acknowledged by various organizations, and I do appreciate that. And I would say, as far as anyone listening, you never really quit karate or martial arts. It's something you do for the rest of your life. You're either a martial artist or you're not. So, you know, people say, oh, I quit because um, I didn't have the time. Well, actually, I don't believe you really quit because that's like saying, well, I'm, I'm almost going to forget everything I learned, and you don't do that. So karate or martial arts, whatever you practice, taekwondo, whatever, you do this for the rest of your life, and it will enhance your life. And I wish everybody well. Thank you for listening to Episode 68 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sensei DeRico. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, the quiz, some photos, and a video with some highlights from the movie Billy Jack. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. Remember, if we read yours on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of, and our username is always Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at Whistlekick.com, like our wonderfully comfortable sweatpants. Seriously, you won't want to take them off. That's all for today. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.